working on the grant. Hey, John Gray, it's good to see you guys. We're gonna, we've got about seven more minutes before we go live. So just hang tight uh, and, and we'll get started right at 11 o'clock. I'm so glad to see you guys here. Thank you.
Hey, Cayman Prep, it's awesome to see you guys. We're gonna get started in five minutes, almost there. Thank you so much for being here. Hello, everybody. So glad you're here. Just a couple of more minutes before we get started, but I just wanted to check in. John Gray and Cayman Prep, um, give me a wave if you can hear me okay. Can you guys hear me all right? Okay, awesome. Great. I just wanted to be sure. And you can see me all right? Is it is it really pixelated? Okay. It's sometimes difficult when we're out here on the water to get a good signal. All right, good. Well, uh, just one more minute and we're going to get started. Hey, Spot Bay. So glad you guys are here. Awesome. Woo. Yeah, I'm going to pull you guys up here. Yeah. Hey, guys. Uh, so we're just we're just about ready. Give us about one more minute, and then we're going to get started with today's live stream. I think you guys are going to love it.
It looks like we lost Cayman Prep. We're going to give them just a minute to, to get back online. So hold tight. All right, there we are. Good to see you, Cayman Prep. Okay, so welcome, everyone. My name's Todd. Uh, I'm a volunteer educator with Reef, the Reef Environmental Education Foundation. And we're out here at the Grouper Moon Project on Little Cayman. Um, and today is our third and final live stream from the aggregation out here, um, watching all the incredibly beautiful and um, ever-growing mass of, of NASA that are living out here. And um, today, uh, we're going to get to take you underwater, and you guys are going to see uh, these incredible fish that we've been talking about and everything else that's uh, under the water there. And uh, I have a few folks that are going to be helping us out today. Um, so first, I'm going to introduce you guys to Bryce. Bryce, why don't you come on up here? Introduce yourself to everybody. Hi, everybody. My name is Bryce Simmons. I'm a professor at Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego, and I'm excited to be here for the Gruber Moon Project. This is, I think, my 20th year being part of this project, so I've seen uh, big changes happening with, with uh, the Gruber Moon population and, and all of the different species that are showing up for this, for this aggregation. What have you, what, what's been your overall uh, feeling about this year? Like, ha have things been going well? Do, are the fish out there? Is Are things happening the way that you would expect them to? Absolutely. Yeah. It's been an amazing year for, for us. Uh, last year was a little tough because we had two different moons. Because of the way the moon fell in January and February, we weren't sure which moon the fish were going to spawn. And it turns out they showed up for both. So, that so was, it could have been, they could have spawned in January. They could have spawned in February. So you came for both. Exactly. Yeah. But, but this year, because the full moon happened very early in February, we knew that this was going to be the big spawning month and we were right. And so all of the fish are out there, which is great for us because we can get a, a whole population count of all the fish that are on Little Cayman. And what's been really amazing is we've had good weather. Yeah. So it's it's a little rough right now. Uh, probably you wouldn't want to be out on a small boat out here, but it's it's underneath the water underneath the waves there's been very little current which has been great for us because we don't really have to kick very hard to get to the fish and we can spend a lot of time with them right now a, another thing that's interesting that's happened this year is that they started spawning earlier than normal when do they normally start spawning yeah in in years past we've seen spawning happen somewhere between usually three to as many as eight days after the full moon right uh, so we would expect in, in February that would be around February 10th. This year we saw spawning the day after full moon. That was the that was the first day of spawning. So that's much earlier. So you weren't expecting that. We weren't expecting it. It's great though. Yeah. Uh, we saw spawning the the night before last. Last night we're expecting to see lots of spawning uh, tonight as well because we know that there are lots of fish in in the aggregation and you guys are going to see that because we got divers on the aggregation right now and uh, if you weren't able to join yesterday's live stream um i've shared the the link with all of your teachers and it's on um reef's youtube page but if you watch yesterday's live stream we shared a bunch of video of the um spawning that took place uh two nights ago so so definitely check that out you can also find that on the blog the grouper education blog um, that that has the links and I've also been posting a lot of behind the scenes stuff that's been happening on the project on that blog so I encourage you either on your own or with your class to check out the education blog and you can find some more information about what's going on okay so I think it looks like our divers are coming up we're gonna go yeah. we're gonna go find those go ahead. yeah I was just gonna say yeah so we so we're out here on the west end of, of little Cayman right now and we have uh, divers in the water that are coming back up onto the boat. We're actually, we're on the RV Seakeeper, which is the Cayman government's research vessel that we bring over to Grouper Moon every year. And, and they're coming back on board and they're going to hand off their hard drive so that we can plug it in and hopefully take a look at, at what they saw. There was, we have one of our divers that's been taking a video the whole time. So keep your fingers crossed that uh, the camera didn't flood and that there were no technical issues. Okay. Like, uh, Let's, let's let that happen for us. Okay, we're, I'm going to take you guys over, and we're going to we're going to watch them come out of the water. All right, here they're coming up. Will you bring the phone over here? 
So the two divers we have in the water right now are uh, Tom and Paul. Tom is one of our research divers that's part of uh, the Reef Environmental Education Foundation. And Paul is a research officer with the Cayman Islands Department of the Environment. This is Tom coming up now. Tom's the one that's been collecting the video, so you'll see his camera coming up on deck. Check out that camera, you guys. Hey, Tom. Hey, hey Tom. Doing, this is guys? Captain Martins helping us with the, all of the, the research and uh, put, bring, helping people get in and out of the water, which is an important step, of course. All right. Beautiful down there, Bryce. Awesome. Those are giant fins. And then who else is down there in the water? Oh, oops. All right, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Paul as well. Paul Chen from the Department of Environment. Down there. There All right, and I don't know if you can see Paul. He's just starting to ascend now. There he is. Hey, Paul. How was it? Hey, guys. Fantastic. All right. All right. So we're, what we're going to do now, I'm going to take you guys back in, and we're going to hook up the – we're going to get the hard drive off of that giant camera that you just saw. We're going to plug it in here, and we're going to see – and we're going to walk – they're going to walk us through what happened down there. Did everything go okay, you guys? Yeah, fantastic. Awesome. All right. The hard drive? Okay, there we go. So let's get that plugged in. Hold on one second while we work some technical magic. All right. Here we go. Hold on one second. I'm going to pull up the file. And then in a moment, we'll, we'll be joined by Tom and, and Paul, who are out there, who can talk to us also about the, uh, um, the video that they just shot. Hey, look at that. There we go. All right. So this is the beginning of the dive. They're just starting to ascend. So Bryce, why don't descend, you come yeah. out or descend? Yes. Yeah. My apologies. Why don't you tell us kind of where we're at here and what we're seeing? Absolutely. Yeah. So it looks like Tom uh, started the camera after he got down to the bottom. So normally when we jump into the dive site, it's fairly deep here. So uh, roughly around 80 to 90 feet. So it takes a little while to get down. So oftentimes when we bring our cameras with us, we don't start our camera till we're on the bottom. That allows us to save memory space on our hard drives as well as battery. So we have battery to last the whole dive. That's a great shot of a big barrel sponge. Where these fish aggregate tends to be a, a place that is deep, right on the wall and very currenty. And because of that, there's a lot of water movement and that water movement is very good for sponges. So we see a lot of those big barrel sponges. Barrel sponges filter water, so they're water filterers, and that's how they get their food. You guys are just starting to see now. Oh, there's another sponge. That's a, and that. Tom's here now. Tom, why don't you come on here onto the camera so they can see you? Can you tell us about that camera, that giant camera that we just saw? What it? I mean, that looked like something from that goes in outer space. Yeah, it's a it's a big camera. It's it's really good and powerful because it's able to get a lot of light into the lens. And when you're down there that deep, um, a lot of that light tends to disappear, and often you actually lose the red color. So that camera really is pretty spectacular in the way that it brings out a lot of the color. So here, I'm just kind of showing you some of the general reef. As you can see, there's a lot of sponges down there that are deep. Um, here we have like a tube sponge. And you can see a lot of smaller fish. They're like little bicolored damsel fish and there's a little ras that goes by. Oh. And all of these fish come together to build this ecosystem that all works as one. And all, all of these different fish and animals have different roles in that ecosystem. So we, we often talk about it like it's a city and everything that lives in the city has a job, right? To maintain this perfect balance on the reef. Exactly, right? So the sponge's job is to kind of filter the water. And then out here, let's see what we can spot out here. There's more of those barrel sponges we were talking about that like to Now, how big are those? It's hard to see from this, but they're they're quite big, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, I'm really tall. I'm six foot eight, and I could probably fit inside one of those. Just to give so, you a... like, giant. Absolutely giant. And massive. Actually, we'll often oh, see... Oh, here we've got a shot. Uh oh Caribbean reef shot. 
Look at that. Did you see several of the sharks on that? Yeah, day? so this is quite deep. Now we're below 100 feet. And there's three Caribbean reef shark that are kind of circling just back and forth off that wall, kind of hanging out, just for waiting for the action to happen. Because at night, they'll actually hunt the, the groupers. So how many, have we been seeing sharks out there every night? It seems to be the same three that keep showing up. Um, I don't know, how many have you seen, Bryce? I've seen, uh, well, this morning I saw three or four sharks. Wow. Yeah, they're, they're they, they, you know, it's funny, sharks don't like to be around humans. They like to be around fish uh, because, of course, that's their dinner. But they don't like to be around humans so much. So it's not, it's very uncommon normally to see this many sharks. But when you get this many fish aggregating on one site, the sharks kind of have to be around humans when we're down there doing research so that they can be near their food. All right, so it looks like we're coming up on some on a big mass of fish there. Yeah, so the, so now we're coming up on the aggregation of fish. And you, remember, earlier we were talking about how there's not been a lot of current down there. And when there's not a lot of current, uh, the, the fish are free to mill around up in the water column. And so they'll spend a lot of their dive. Obviously, you guys saw this on, the, on that dive. They'll spend a lot of time up in the water column, milling around, checking each other out, and, and um, trying to decide which fish are the right fish to mate with on, in the evening dives when it comes time to spawn. And like we talked about before, if you were with us in one of our earlier feeds, the Nassau group right here, they take on different color phases than we're used to seeing on the home reefs. They have that oftentimes all black or all white or that bicolor, the black on the top and the white on the bottom. So that's a very clear indication that they're ready to spawn. And that coloration, we think, indicates to other grouper that, hey, I'm not here to fight. I'm, I'm here to spawn. So, Paul, why don't you come on in here, too? You guys, sure, sure, sure. Say hi to Paul. Tell us. Hey, guys. How you doing? Tell us what, what you do here on the project, Paul. Well, here on the project, um, I tend to do a lot of things. Um, whatever the reef team needs me to do, I, I tend to fill in all the gaps. So um, sometimes I go down with a camera, a GoPro, and I fish. I, I film all the faces of the fish, the sides of the fish. Um, we have a software program that recognizes um, the, the stripes of the fish, and each fish has distinctive striping. Um, it's almost like a fingerprint, essentially. And so we, ca we try to capture as many fish, fish faces as we can. We also do counts. Um, if you guys are with us in one of the earlier feeds where um, Dr. Lynn told you about the, the tags that we put inside the, the fishes, um, we put them in the fish and then we count as many fish as we can for as long as we can, as long as the fish are down there. Uh, we have stereo video. Um, so anything that happens, um, anything that happens down there and anything that needs to be gathered, any data that needs to be gathered, I'm usually involved in all of it. So you were you were just down there. They don't seem to be very concerned with you guys, right? No, like, they, they seem to be control uh, concerned about one another. Uh, right. So it's almost like a, a courting uh, expedition, right. essentially. So they're so focused on each other. That they're not even worried about our presence, really. And uh, if you notice, they're not even worried about the shark's presence either. And some of them, you guys, you can see their bellies are really, really fat. And those those are the females that are filled with gametes. Now, who's who, Tom? Who's that? Yeah, there? so this is Ali. Uh, as you can see, she, she's got a lot of equipment on her back, so she has a scooter. It helps us to navigate, and there's a lot of current down there quite often. So often we'll use these scooters to move <laughs> around the site to make sure we get into areas where the fish are, because sometimes they move. So and that's what, what she's doing there. She's counting. Yeah, here she's she's doing counts. So what she's doing is she's going around and identifying 50 sides of a fish. And she's looking for these very small little tags that we insert on the side of the fish. They're really bright pink. So keep your eyes out to see if you can see any later on. So what she's doing is she's going around and counting. And we can use this information um, and have a ratio between how many tags and how many counts. And we can use that to estimate the population of the NASA grouper. And hey, guys, we talked about that yesterday with Dr. Lynn. And... Um, uh, Dr. Lynn made a, a small uh, mathematical error uh, when describing this mathematical process. And so um, she created a, a great graphic for you guys that I posted on the the, the education. Um, oh, and there's that, one of those tags tag. right yeah, there. That's a little pink tag. See that bright pink one tag? Right in the background. Those are the tags that they're looking for. But to understand how we use the um, how we use the tags to estimate the, the number, go on to the, the, the blog and you can see the slide that she created for you. Oh, and then we see another tag on that light-colored guy right beneath his dorsal fin. 
So All the, right. the reason that we do that tagging work um, is so with you guys in the classroom, you're watching this video. I want you to look at that and think, OK, how many fish do I see? How many fish are there in that in that in that cloud? It's hard, right? I mean, it's it's difficult to estimate just by looking at it how many fish are there. And that's why we do the tag counts. Because if we if we can constantly do those counts of tag to untag fish, it allows us to estimate the proportion of the fish in the population that are tagged. And if we know how many tags are put out, that gives us an estimate of the total population size. So that's why that's a really important step. But uh, as Paul pointed out, we're also doing fish faces. So we're taking cameras and we're recording individual fish. And you'll notice as you see these fish, they've all got patterns, right? Every single one of them looks a little different, just like you and me. If you've got a phone and you look at your phone, it recognizes you and it opens for you. It uses facial recognition. We're doing the exact same thing with grouper. We're using the footage that we shoot underwater, just like what you're seeing right now. And we're doing pattern matching, facial recognition to keep track of individual fish. And by doing that, we hope to ultimately replace these tags. There's another example of a, of a tagged fish. And if we do that, we can now not only say, hey, this is a tag fish or not, but we can keep track of individuals. So we can say, ah, that's Bob the fish. We've seen Bob the fish at the last feet five years. He's grown three centimeters. All of that becomes possible with facial recognition. And there you see somebody capturing that facial recognition uh, video data right now. So that there, um, that's, I believe, Sabrina. that's Sabrina, yeah. um, a DOE uh, scientist that's doing facial uh, data capture with the GoPro. And we take that back. To, we're using our computers to do data processing to get individual fish from, from all of this data we're generating. And so it's kind of like you're creating like a class roster of the aggregation right? Like uh, you're going to keep adding more and more fish faces to this list of fish that you've seen come up and you're looking to see repeat visits every year, right? So yeah. That you have an idea of what's going on. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, that's really important because it allows us to estimate things like growth and survival of individual fish. And that is hugely important for allowing us to build uh, accurate population models so we can say what's going on with the populations in Cayman and then help to provide information for the Department of Environment to to put in place appropriate management for the species so that we continue to have this aggregation, but also so that we have fish that are able to be caught uh, outside of spawning season so people can reliably catch fish and, and put a piece of fish on a plate. So um, Bryce, tell us, how does this look? And, and, and Paul as well, you've been here since the very beginning. How does this compare to what you guys were seeing 15 years ago when you were when we were starting this project i mean was was this was this the scene no it wasn't actually how, um, how is it different i mean more fish but so the the fish have gone from just a few a couple thousand to um we haven't quite gotten the the accurate estimates for this year but um judging from my estimates and for the 10 years that are or the 12 years that i've been doing it this is the most fish that we've seen on the aggregate and in, in the last decade so it just goes to show that uh, our conservation efforts and our study efforts are are, are, pro are producing fruit, as it were. So this is a good sign. Well, and when I was out there, I was noticing a lot more really big, big fish. fish. Yeah. And a lot of little ones as yes. well, which so is you're really seeing... cool to see yeah. because the little ones... So what does ones... that mean? What does that mean that we're seeing more big fish and more little fish? Yeah, so the, the, big, the large fish are really important because as a female, as you get larger, you actually produce more eggs, and those eggs are of much higher quality as well. So the chances of those little babies surviving out there in the deep blue ocean and returning back to the reef is much higher once that female becomes larger. So it's really important to have those really large-bodied fish in their ecosystem. Hey, Tom, I see a diver with a different kind of camera Yeah, here. so actually this is Scott, and this actually ties in really well. This... This is a stereo video camera. So it's actually two GoPros and a light. And we're actually able to use this camera to calculate the depth of field. And this is will give us an estimate what do you of the mean length. When you say stereo camera, because I, when I think stereo, I think of my dad's stereo the, like, yeah. at home. Well, it's audio. Like stereo audio means two speakers. OK, got okay? it. And like stere this stereo video camera works the same ways that our eyes do. So if you close one eye, you kind of lose that depth of field. But as soon as you have two eyes open, you're able to sense kind of where things are in 3D space. And so that helps you do what? So it helps us to actually measure the, the length of the fish to be able to get a 
better estimate of how many large fish there are and how many small fish there are. No, uh, didn't we used to use lasers to do that? I remember. Yeah. Well, what? Why is the, is this better? This new this new uh, technique that we're using? Yeah. So we used to use uh, fifteen years ago. We used to use a single camera, and then we would have two. Uh, dual lasers, two lasers that were perfectly parallel. So the two dots those lasers produced were always exactly 20 centimeters apart. So as long as we caught those two dots on the side of a fish, because we knew the distance between those two dots is 20 centimeters, we could estimate the size of individual fish. Now that worked. It was good, but we had to do one fish at a time. With our stereo video system, now we can measure every single fish that we see in our field of view within our camera. So we can get hundreds and hundreds of fish per dive versus just tens of fish in the past. So it's much more powerful. Here's a great example of a, of a more standard coloration of an Nassau grouper. So this is a perfect example of the types of data that we would use AI facial recognition on. So this fish will look the exact same five, 10 years from now that it does right now. It's going to have all that specifics of those dots and patterns and bars and stripes. That fish is unique and it will, it will maintain that pattern through time. Using computer software, we can keep track and find that fish again into the future. Now, one of the other reasons that we love highlighting this dive is um, it, it shows us a, a pretty healthy reef. And so I'm wondering if you guys can identify what are some of the indicators that would tell us that this is a, a healthier reef ecosystem? Well, one of the indications of a healthy reef ecosystem, first and foremost, is the abundance of predators. So, the way Could you explain that? Because I don't think a lot of people understand that it's important to have a lot of predators. Sure. So predators indicate, uh, give you a, a strong indication of how much top-down pressure there is, top-down in from, a, from the sense of our human population, how many of these large predators are pulled out of a system. So if you've got a system, if you've got a reef that's got a lot of top predators, it usually means it's very healthily managed because there are still top predators. So the, pre the top predators actually help keep it healthy. And, and when you have those top predators in the water, exactly right, the top predators are really important for keeping the rest of the system below them healthy. You think about it in terms of things like wolves in Yellowstone, maybe you've heard of that example where they thin the herd, right? right. So they, they're the ones that are responsible for taking the sick animals out of a population and leaving the healthy ones there to reproduce. The same thing happens on a reef ecosystem. If you have top predators playing a role as predators in the system, it makes the rest of the system below it much more healthy to include things like corals and sponges. So it's all part of a connected chain, the ecosystem. Now, what else are you guys seeing out here besides just these Nassau grouper? I've noticed some other fish floating around and, and yesterday we were watching some of the spawning um, the spawning videos and we were seeing a lot of fish up in the water column while they were spawning. Are those fish out there all the time? Yeah, well, let's, let's, let's point out here about this. this. Yeah, um, What's going on there? So what, what you saw that, what is that? Yeah, what is Paul? that? Paul, what's going on? Paul, tell us about. Okay, that's, um, that's actually a, a camera that's mounted to a scooter and he goes back and forth uh, along the aggregate just um, photographing and, and putting together uh, some footage of the aggregate as he scoots along. So he's going to make a few passes. You can see he's got the, the scooter attached to his body with the camera mounted on top. And then he just scoots, makes a couple passes. And that way it gives us an accurate, an accurate sort of a, a vision or view of, of what we're looking at right now and how vast or how densely populated the fish are in the aggregate. So he's actually going around that whole mass of fish. Yes, trying he is. To get the, a pan of a all pan of, of everything. Yes, yeah. he is. Have you ever dived with a a, a scooter like that with a with a propeller? I so mean we have we have a um, couple of different types of scooters. This one is a is a handheld scooter, um, and he needs this so that he can mount his camera to it. But some of our other divers, like uh, Tom and Ali, you may have seen it in the video. We have tank mounted scooters. It's almost like a thruster. If you ever seen in the movies, they have uh, sort of like a, a rocket thrusters where you push a button and then you shoot up into the <laughs> air. It's like so you, you push a trigger and it kind of scoots you along, and that helps with um with navigating the aggregate. Um, sometimes the currents down there gets quite um quite quite strong and um that helps us as well to manage a dive and um, helps us to um, collect our data a lot more easier 
So, wow. so back to Todd's question then, what, what other fish did you all see when you were on this, on this dive? Yeah, what were you guys seeing down there besides the NASA? Who else is hanging out with them? Well, it's interesting. This is, yeah, this is not just an aggregation just for NASA group. It seems like this site really is the perfect place to spawn because it's right on the west end. It's kind of away from the main island. So it's away from the majority of the predators that live on the reef. And also it allows the, the babies a chance to kind of spread wide and far in those ocean currents. And what's quite spectacular is these NASA groupers actually know the exact night when to spawn so that those ba baby eggs have the best chance to basically go out to the ocean and return back to the little cane. So we're seeing other types of groupers out there. We're seeing a lot of yellowfin groupers. Uh, there's a few black groupers, but we're seeing a lot I of some tiger, tiger, groupers. Tiger, tiger groupers, a lot of jacks. You know, and there's a lot of fish that are actually also attracted to that spawning and actually going there and predating on those eggs so not just the sharks are going there to take advantage no of it's this. not just the sharks that are eating the grouper it's there's also smaller fish that are eating those eggs as well the gametes oh, so that are, uh, and what are the more common fish that are out there eating all those gametes you get a lot of scad a lot of bar jacks okay like that. yeah wow you know it's re really interesting is one of the research projects we're doing is we're looking we're collecting a very very tiny amount of those eggs and we're looking at the chemical composition of those eggs. The reason why is because when those moms produce those eggs and release them, they provide essential vitamins in those eggs so that their babies can grow, just like you guys probably take some vitamins or you've heard about vitamins and why they're important. So the moms give those eggs vitamins that are really otherwise very essential. They, they put a lot into those eggs. Well, if you're an egg predator, that's great because you can go if you can go and eat those eggs, you get all those vitamins for yourself. So They're nutrient rich nutrient is really important. So not only is this an important for reproduction, but this is an important source of food for lots oh, look of at that. Yeah, look at that special Keep one. Yawning. Oh, I must have had a busy night. <laughs> yeah, they do a lot of yawning and we're not exactly sure why they do that yawning, but we think it might be a display. It's just like it's like flexing sort of, you know, so you, but that's a newer behavior. At least for me, I haven't seen that on much of the video that we've had in previous years, but this year I've seen it quite often. Yeah. And I don't know whether or not it's just because of the, the currents we've been able to get closer to the fish or if things have changed behaviorally, you know, things change all the time at this aggregation because every year we have so many more fish than we've ever had. Right. And so things are changing in ways that we can't predict because we've never seen it before. It's important to note that this aggregation that you all are looking at right now is the largest aggregation remaining for this species anywhere in the world. And it's here in Cayman. So you all should be really proud of this. Well, and we have a school from, from the BRAC on here, um, Spot Bay. Hey, you guys, um, were, were some of you guys out on the BRAC a couple of days ago? What, what, were you, what did you see? Was it like this? It's, it's not quite as many fish, but it's still really impressive because the Cayman BRAC population really drops a very low levels where it was a, a real critical point where if you know we lost any more of those fish potentially we wouldn't be able to recover that population so what we're seeing there is the population maybe went down to around 500 fish and our estimates now are probably around 1500 2000 fish out there so it's a really good success story like the management of this species really is working to recover that population so we have a healthy population for people to go and you know catch during the off season that's incredible oh my gosh what is this red light that we see in this video here? Is that on the stereo camera? Why is it? Do you see how that Yeah, that's on the stereo video. Um, and that's just to basically gets quite dark down there. So you need a little bit of extra light. But because of that really big camera that I've taken yeah. down, you know, it's actually able to adjust the light and bring a lot of that red back into the video footage. So I do a, it's called a white balance and that makes all of the other lights look really red. So it's actually white down there and it's just a trick of the camera. So it's, it's really important that we, I wanted to bring it back to BRAC really quick because it's really important we talk about what a success story BRAC is. And and Paul, you dove there the last couple yes. of years. Yes, have. What, what have you seen in terms of changes in the population? Well, you know what, um, after um, like a, like what he's, like what Tom said, he, we thought that the, um, the population was decimated. And last year, after taking a dive off of, um, off of the, the aggregate yeah, last year, we came across a school of uh, what we estimated to be a couple of thousand fish. So um, that, again, uh, like Mr. Bryce said, that is a success story that to show that with the right um, mechanisms in place, the population can recover. So um, Brack, you should be proud of that. And uh, I hope you guys tell all your friends, tell all your parents and have them do what they can
to keep the population healthy. And what's kind of crazy is we don't even know like when what the real population should be. should be. It just keeps going up and up and up. And we're on a relatively small island here with not much reef. And right. you know, to have that amount of fish at these aggregations is pretty spectacular. So that's actually a good point too, because um, we've been focusing on grand, we've been focusing on little. I mean, sorry, brack and little. We haven't mentioned grand. Uh, grand is a little bit more tricky because, like uh, like Tom said, there's a lot more reef, a lot more real estate that we have to cover, and um, the the depth on the wall in the ground is a little bit deeper, so it becomes a little bit more tricky to locate the fish. Not to say that there's not any um, any Nassau grouper aggregate in the, in Grand. It's just a little bit more difficult to 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 find them. But we have been seeing a lot of um, younger fish along the reefs, so there's a possibility that there's an aggregate. Um, in some of the traditional sites, um, but the studies that we're doing here in the BRAC and Little Cayman will help us with um, further studies in Grand as well. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, like like Paul said, um, it's very very hard to to get data from the east end of, of Grand because of the depths of that location. How deep are they? It's it's the fish as far as we're aware, based on some of our drop camera work, where we actually send a camera down off the back of a boat without a diver they're at around 150 160 feet which is really deep too deep for us to dive on regular equipment and there's usually a very strong current they're too strong for divers to be in almost always so it's very challenging we still try and do work there in terms of drop cameras but i think exactly right what 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 mr paul said is very true that in the last decade or so, we see more and more of, of Nassau grouper on reef sites, suggesting very strongly that there is a recovery there as well. That's amazing. So how deep are we here on this, on the site here on Little Cayman? How, how deep are you guys when you were filming? Whoa, whoa. A little, <laughs> little rocky here, guys. Sorry about that. <laughs> a little rocky. Yeah, how deep were you on that dive? Like what, we, what try, we, try, we try not to go past, um, past uh, 100 feet. Um, due to, to um, air restrictions, uh, we're diving on nitrox. So um, after a certain point, uh, it gets a little dangerous. So we had to we try to keep it at about 100 feet and above. And so diving at 100 feet, how long are you guys able to stay down there with those fish for, on each of your dives? Yeah, it really depends a lot on the on the current as well. Yeah. So it why? Depends how much you work, right? So if like there's if more you current, have to really, you're having to kick yeah, harder. You have to kick hard and swim hard then you use up a lot more of your air. So we've been really lucky this week that the conditions have allowed us to spend as much time at the bottom as possible to get as much data as possible. So probably at the bottom, we're collecting data for around 20, 25 minutes, and then we slowly come up to the surface. I see. Now, last night, the, the spawning continued. And when we came to pick you guys up from the dock, you had um, giant bags filled with seawater and that you brought them back to the, to the apartment. What, what are you guys doing with all those eggs? Yeah, so that like like we talked about a little bit before, one of the things that we're doing is we're using those eggs to look at how much nutrients mothers give to their offspring, so we can say things about how how important different mothers are to producing good quality eggs, but also understanding how much energy these eggs provide to all the other fishes that rely upon them here in in the islands. The other thing we're doing is we're looking at raising baby grouper in the lab under different temperature treatments. And the reason we're doing that is we're trying to trying to paint a picture for what the Cayman government might expect for uh, the future when water temperatures continue to warm in terms of the ability of the these baby larvae to survive and turn into adults. Now, Tom, it looks like you're starting to get a little bit further away from the fish here. Is that, are you starting to ascend? Is that what's going on? Yeah, I'm starting to ascend now. So as you can see, there's divers still working along the bottom. So here we have Berkeley on his scooter. So he's continuing to do some pass. But yeah, I'm starting to ascend now. Just again, just managing how much air I have. Right. I'm starting you to can only stay down there for 25 yeah. minutes or so at that depth, right? Okay. So you guys, I hope that you love that video. What I want to do is I want to pull you up here onto the screen and take some of your questions. All right, so it looks like we've got uh, Spot Bay and, um, uh, and John Gray on. And uh, if you guys have questions, you can unmute yourselves and call out the questions, or you can have your teacher type the question into the chat. But you've got, you've got all the scientists here uh, ready for you, ready to talk to you and take your questions. So if there's anything else that you want to, or anything that you want to say, please, um, shoot out some questions to us. We'll give you a second. There's someone down here. 
So one of the questions that we had yesterday, I'm going to throw this out to you guys, um, was well, what can we do to protect the NASA? You know, and I've had a lot of the students, so, okay, well, how, how can we help? What can you guys lend, you know, some advice or thoughts about how, you know, ev everyone might be able to pitch in? Yeah, well, um, the Cayman Islands government has actually implicated some legislation um, that has, uh, puts a limit on, on size catching. So um, the limit is uh, 16 inches to 24 inches inclusively. And we mentioned that on one of the previous um, previous live, uh, live streams. And uh, that's in place so that we can keep all the breeders and all the younger fish on the reef so that we can increase the population so in the way that you can help is just by abiding by those laws fishing where you're supposed to fish and if you get something that's outside of that catch limit just make sure to re to release it as tasty as the fish are you might want to stay by and stick stick within the laws yeah and it's i would say it's very important to allow them especially during this window of time when when they're out here reproducing uh it's important that we allow them to do that because this is the only time during the year when they spawn the rest of the entire year outside of the winter full moons, they don't reproduce at all. So if we, and, and when they spawn, they only do it over about three or four days. So that is a very critical window of time for making sure we have new babies every year. So it's really important that we let them make those babies for that tiny window of time so that there's more fish around the reef for the rest of the year. Thank you for explaining that. That's awesome. And, we, and we've got some questions coming in. So Spot Bay, the question is, have conservation, are, have conservation efforts been working? And is the grouper population increasing rapidly? Great question, Spot Bay. Paul, you want to take that? Um, I can, if you like. Uh, I would. Well, our conservation efforts have actually, uh, as you can see, uh, well, as we mentioned before, the population has grown um, from a, a couple of thousand to possibly um, 8,000 fish or more over the last decade or so. Um, but that doesn't go to say that it's growing rapidly. These fish take a long time to grow. It takes a couple of years before they reach maturity to even go onto the aggregate, let alone to start to, 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 to be the size of the fish that we see in some of these videos. So the population is recovering and the conservation efforts are working, but it's a long process. Um, as, as I mentioned before, it took, it's taken a decade for it to reach to this point. And um, we're, we're noticing some changes in things that what we thought that we knew, but there's still more data to gather. There's still more information to get. So we, um, we just got to stick with what we're doing, continue to do what we're doing. And hopefully the population will get to where we originally thought it was historically. Yeah. And where do we think it was historically? How, uh, how big do you think that <laughs> aggregation could have been? I mean, that's, that's the great question, that's right? right. right. So, so, I mean, I'll put it to you guys. How many sharks do you think is enough sharks on a reef? How many big grouper do you think are enough on a reef? And, and I mean, if you ask the scientists here, right, we're, we're in the water, we're doing this work. None of us knows the answers to that because we've never seen a reef without any fishing on top. So we've never seen what a reef that's pristine looks like in terms of predators. But what's really amazing is since you know, the start of this project over 20 years ago, we've seen that population steadily increase mm -hmm. and it hasn't slowed down. So we're seeing higher abundances, higher densities of fish, higher numbers of fish on reefs than we've ever seen and are have ever seen anywhere in the Caribbean, let alone in the Cayman Islands, are right here in our islands and, and it's still growing. So I, it's a really, really exciting period of time because it allows us to ask this question of man, how many big predators can a reef support? And it sure seems like the answer is a lot more than anyone thought. Historically, have there been like how big of what are some of the biggest aggregations that that we've heard that we've read about? Yeah, I mean, so the very first aggregation that was ever reported in the literature was from the Bahamas. They uh, estimated that it was over 100,000 fish. Wow. So we're nowhere near that. But again, we're only on an island that's about 11, 12 kilometers long, right? The Bahamas are huge. Right. Bahamas are huge. Little Cayman, Cayman Brac, they're not nearly as big as that, but they still have a large population. What's really interesting, though, is scientists recently went back to that site that was reported to be over 100,000 in the Bahamas. No fish left. Not one. Not one. So it's, that's why it's really important to, to do the work that the Cayman Islands government is doing, the Department of Environment is doing, is because it's even if you've got a population that big, it can go away due to, due to mismanagement, to, to not doing things the right way.
Okay, Spot Bay, that was a great question. And we have another question from John Gray. The question is, who provides the funding for the research and technology? And then the second follow-up was, I'm not sure, CARICOM, Caricom yeah. helped. Anyone want to touch that? I, I, can, I can briefly, and yeah. Paul, you and can add uh, from the DOE side, Department of Environment side. So our, our project has been funded we've been doing this for over two decades now right so so it takes a village we get a lot of local support from island businesses uh, department of environment supports financially as well as all of the resources and most importantly their scientific expertise and their expertise on the water without the department of environment's expertise and understanding these waters and knowing historical context this work would not happen so they're huge obviously they're a huge part of this project they are the part of this project we get support grants from different nonprofit organizations. We get grants for the National Science Foundation. So really we've pieced it together over time with lots of different funding sources. That's kind of the way it goes with long-term monitoring projects. You have to find money where you can to keep it going. We eat a lot of ramen. <laughs> we, 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 we go on the cheap in order to put as much money as we can into the research so that we, we can keep doing the work that we do. CARICOMP has not contributed. Uh, it doesn't mean that they won't, and there's 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 no problem with that. It's just not something that CARICOMP has, has engaged with uh, to date. And we had, I just want to uh, add that when, when we started the education component for this, um, doing these underwater dives and coming out and meeting with you guys and sharing these lesson plans, um, uh, Disney, we actually was, was who uh, gave us the seed grant, the seed money for starting this. So, uh, you know, there have been quite a few actors that have helped to support this really amazing project. Yeah, and definitely the all the local community as well. You know, we're using local dive results and their docks and their dive tanks and, you know, a lot of people, it's a real huge team effort that, you know, every single piece contributes to that. All right, do we have any more questions? It looks like, uh, it looks like some typing's going on. So um, let's give you guys one sec to come up with a question and then uh, we have a question here. Yes, what's your question? <laughs> it's okay, uh, don't be shy. You come up and ask. Um, why do NASA groupers normally spawn at full moon? Why do they, why do they spawn, spawn on the full moon? moon? <laughs> That is an excellent question. And you know, that's a question we've been trying to answer. Can you believe that? So consider yourself a scientist immediately. You're hired. <laughs> we, we don't know why they, they reproduce when they do. We don't know why specifically it's around the full moon, but we have some thoughts. One of them is that they spawn in the Cayman Islands at the coldest window of time for water temperature in the whole year. So we think that they are choosing to spawn in the winter full moons because that is the optimal temperature for those eggs and larvae to survive and to grow. So that's one reason. The other reason we think is that they're queuing in to the full moon specifically because it's an obvious uh, environmental cue, something that they can see or hear or taste in the environment that it's common throughout the islands no matter where you are doesn't matter if you're on the east end or the west end, the currents may be different, the waves may be different, but the light from the moon is always the same. So it's a really good cue, environmental cue, that everybody in a whole region can get to and say, ah, okay, I see a lot of light from the moon, it's time for me to go and spawn. And, and so that's maybe why, but we, we don't really know. So it's a really awesome question. We're trying to get the answer to it and we'll report back. And so, and that's why we encourage you guys to, you know, you're interested in, in being a scientist or getting involved in marine sciences. You know, you can be coming and, and working on projects like this, working with the DOE and, and helping to solve some of these uh, questions that we still, that we still don't know the answer to. Um, it looks like we have another question from John Gray. And the question is, uh, the rapid decline in population in the Bahamas, is that due to overfishing or other environmental issues? It's almost assuredly due to overfishing. overfishing. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So one of the things that we know is true for NASA grouper, and this exactly happened in, in, in history here in the Caymans, is when you fish it very hard, when you take most, many, almost all of the fish out of a population, the few remaining fish that are left in the, in the population will often pick up and start aggregating someplace else. 
That actually happened here in Little Cayman in the 80s. It used to be that the aggregation on Little Cayman was over on the east end of the island, but that aggregation was fished very, very hard through the 80s, right until just before the 1990s. And then the fish stopped showing up and, and nobody knew where those fish were for decades. And it wasn't until 2001 that they were found on the west end of the island. And that's where this research project began because the aggregation has moved. So assuredly, that's what happened in the Bahamas. It was fished so hard that the few remaining fish decided to just go someplace else because it was it was not not a good idea for them to go back to that fishing site. Well, and that's in fact what happened here. Then that was how we found this aggregation, right? right? It because exactly it was right. being fished, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was discovered uh, by a uh, uh, fisherman from the BRAC. Yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly. All right, Spot Bay, do you guys have someone else who wants to come up and ask a question? Uh, just a quick question here. Yeah. Navigation sites around, in and around um, Cayman Brack. Where exactly are they located? Where are the sites on the Brack? So historically, um, there was one uh, on the west end of the Brack. Um, but um, in recent years, the, the, the ones that we found last year and this year are actually on the east end of the Brack. Right next to the bluff. So the conditions out there are really hard sometimes yeah. for diving. Like on days like today, we really quite struggle to get out there, particularly because the waves actually hit that bluff and bounce back and there's a lot of current. So yeah. we get out there as much as possible, but it's it's pretty it's, tough it's going really out difficult, there. Yeah. So it's really much more challenging than diving A lot here. more challenging. Yes. A lot more challenging. Yeah. Excellent question, Spot Bay. Um, and we have time for maybe one more question before we're going to wrap up or, or two. We, we've got more if you've got more. Bring them on up. Go for it, Spot Bay. What is the estimate of how much fish are tagged? Uh, how many fish are tagged? Yeah. Can so you repeat that question? Is, sorry. Yes. The question is, what is the what is the estimate, or how many fish have we tagged? So good question. So so you remember? Uh, yeah. Thank you for that question. So you remember we put those little pink tags in the sides of fish. We call it jewelry. They're not supposed to last that long, but long enough so that we can do counts while they're aggregating. Over here. On Little Cayman, we put up put out about 120 or so, more or less, uh, in a population of of many many thousands. Over on Cayman Brack, we've put out about 75 tags, and again, that population is now probably several thousand. Uh, so so a small proportion of the population. We try and do enough so that we can get good counts to estimate the proportion of the population that's tagged. But we try and put out as few tags as possible because, you know, any tag that you put in a fish is is a possible impact to the population. So we want to minimize that. But if you see tag fish, now you know where they come from, right? And what, what happens if they find a tag? Because those tags fall off, right? They're developed to fall off, and and sometimes people find them, right? Sometimes people find them. Sometimes you know. Remember, uh, like Mr. Paul said, you you can catch these fish outside of aggregation time depending on where they fall in that slot the limit, in yeah. their size. Yeah. So it's it's possible that somebody could legally catch and keep a fish. And if you do, um, the side of that, that tag, there's a number to call to report that tag to the Cayman Islands Department of Environment. And why would you do that? Why, would, why does the DOE want to know that you found a tag? Well, that's a great question. We have never, not ever, seen any fish move from Cayman Brac to Little Cayman or vice versa. It's never happened as far as we know, meaning that all of the Nassau group are over on Cayman Brack are only from Cayman Brack. All of the fish on Little Cayman, they're only Little Cayman fish, right? But never say never, right? It's possible that a fish could, we don't think so, but it's possible. So if you get a, a tag, if you report it, and it just so happens that for whatever reason, that fish might have moved between populations, that would be hugely important information for us to have. So reporting that is really, really critical. So it's really telling us where they are. It's yeah. telling us where they are, where you caught them. We know where they tagged, so we know how far they moved. We tagged them out here on the west end. You catch them all the way on the east, east end. end. Yeah. That tells us something about where fish are moving to and from. It yeah. goes to show that they're that, that wherever they travel, because they can't travel long distances, just not inter-island. I yeah. see. I see. Great question, Spot Bay. Do we have another question? John Gray, you guys got a question? You can holler it out if you do. Cool. How long would it take them to, how many years would it take until the group population would its original numbers? 
How long will it take till the grouper's population does what? Can you repeat your question? How many years would it take until the grouper population returns to its original numbers? To its original numbers. Oh, okay. So the question was, how long will it take for the Nassau grouper uh, aggregation here to get back to original numbers? Yeah, uh, uh, that's, a hard that's, a, that's, <laughs> that's a also, hard you also are now as hired as a scientist <laughs> with the project. That's a great question and what we don't know the answer to. We, we, we do know that the population continues to grow and it's been growing very rapidly for the last decade or more. Uh, there's nothing to say it couldn't keep growing for another decade or so. Um, we, we just don't know. And that's a really important question is how many predators are enough? How many predators until the reef ecosystem can't support anymore? And we don't know what that number is, but that's a really, really exciting prospect for us is to, to get at that question, to understand how many predators a reef ecosystem can support. Wonderful question, Spot Bay. We have time for one more. If anyone else has got another question, let's do one more before we're going to have to head off. Oh, looks like we've got some oh I see a hand at Spot Bay. Uh, why would it take special about gathering for the reef and sometimes It's a big, big voice so we can hear you. What is so special about Grouper spawning in January, February, and sometimes March? So what's so special about them spawning in, in the winter? Yeah, I, I think uh, that's a great question. Wonderful. Yeah, um, we think it's, you know what's interesting? It's interesting. They do spawn here in the winter. You know when they spawn in, in Bermuda? When? In the summer. They okay, spawn Bermuda's further north. Way right? further north. north. Yeah. And, and, but while they spawn in the summer in Bermuda and they spawn in the winter here in the Caymans, they spawn at the exact same water temperature. So we think the reason why they spawn when they spawn here in those winter months is because that's the right, the perfect temperature for babies and for larvae. So, you, so it's really for the survival to ensure okay. those eggs are going to survive to be able to be hatched. That's the best chance. Exactly. So it's the moms basically putting their eggs into, you know, the right temperature conditions. Like, you know, your mom gives you a blanket before you go to bed because it's cold outside. That's what the grouper are doing. They're just putting their eggs into the right temperature. Excellent question, you guys. Hey, can you all say thank you to, uh, to to Paul and Bryce and Tom for taking you guys underwater and answering all your questions? Big wave. You guys are so awesome. Thanks so much for being here. We'll I love you. Guys, you guys rock. Have it was a good day. awesome. Have a great day. And be sure to check the, the, the blog. We'll continue to be posting videos and behind the scenes stuff that's going on on, this, uh, on the aggregation for the next few days. And uh, we just can't thank you enough for being here, you guys. Have a great rest of your day. Go Grouper Moon. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.